Thank you, Jared, for doing a wonderful job leading us in our singing. And thank you to all of you here this morning to worship God, to praise the Lord. God bless you and God bless your family. I'm so happy to see all of you here. And I look forward to our time in the Word of God. You know, this past Thursday, this past Thursday in our weekly Zoom and prayer meeting, weekly Zoom Bible study and prayer meeting, I gave those who, who were able to attend a, a small homework assignment. I gave them a, a small homework assignment. Once we logged off, I asked them if they would pull out some paper and make a list. I asked them to make a list. I asked them to make a list of three things, three areas where they felt they needed to grow. Three areas where I felt, where they felt they needed to grow as Christians. I told them they didn't have to share that list with me or with anybody, but it was something that I wanted them to do. It was an assignment I posed to them because as Christians, as the people of God, we're supposed to be constantly evaluating ourselves. We're supposed to be constantly examining our spiritual walks and our spiritual progress and the areas where we feel we need to grow and also the steps we need to take to grow. In fact, beyond those who were in that Zoom Bible study and prayer meeting on Thursday. Let me do this right now. Let me pose that question to everybody. Let me pose that question even to you right now. As you evaluate your own life, as you evaluate your own spiritual walk and your own spiritual progress, what are some areas where you feel you need to grow? What are some areas where you feel you need to improve and do better? You know, throughout the years, I've been blessed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have heard numerous answers to this question from the people of God. For example, the answer I hear the most when it comes to this, qu this question from, from God's people is they say, I need to grow in my knowledge. They say, I need to know more. I need to know more about the Bible. I need to know more about the Old Testament. I particularly need to know, need to know more about some of those more neglected portions of the Old Testament, like the major and minor prophets and, and the wisdom literature. Others have told me that they felt the need to grow in their faith. Or they felt they needed to grow in the courage to share their faith. Or they felt they needed to grow in their prayer lives and making more time for prayer. Or they felt they needed to grow in their, in their patience. Or in their self-control. Or in their love or in their wisdom. Or maybe just in coming to church. Maybe just in making worshiping God more of a top priority in their lives. Those are, are some common answers that I've heard people give in regards to this question, but you know what I've never heard before? I've never heard anyone ever say, well, Sean, you know what I need to grow in? I need to grow in the very first quality that Peter mentions in 2 Peter 1 and verse 5. I've never heard a Christian ever say to me, you know what I need more of? I need more virtue. I need to grow in my virtue. Virtue, oh, that's something I need to do better at. I need to improve my virtue. I have never heard a Christian ever admit to ever needing to grow in their virtue, and I wonder why that is. I wonder why that is. I wonder why I've never heard any Christian ever admit to lacking in virtue. Could it be that maybe because every Christian I've ever met, ever met has virtue mastered? Maybe every Christian I've ever met, they have conquered virtue. They got it totally down. Or maybe it's because many Christians don't really understand the value of virtue. And what exactly virtue is and how to acquire it and the significance that it has to the life of a Christian. Remember our theme this year is a congregation of God's people. Remember the theme that our shepherds have given us this year. Remember our theme our theme in 2023 is about growing. 
It's about growing to spiritual maturity. It's about growing in spiritual character and in our spiritual walk and in our imitation of Jesus Christ. Remember, just like little babies, and we got a lot of babies in the room right now, just like babies are supposed to grow. And just like puppies are supposed to grow and kittens are supposed to grow and plants are supposed to grow. You know who else is supposed to grow? Christians. Disciples, disciples and all facets of uh, of life, both young and seasoned. Disciples are supposed to grow. In fact, last month, if you remember, we began a monthly series of lessons considering Peter's ingredients for spiritual growth found in 2 Peter chapter 1. Remember, we learned last month that real spiritual growth and real spiritual maturity begins with diligently solidifying our faith. It begins with diligently developing rock solid and strong faith. After we do that, the next thing Peter mentions in that section of scripture is something that may be understudied and undervalued today. It is, it is virtue. It is virtue. Peter says that virtue is a necessary ingredient for spiritual growth. But I guess the question we need to ask right now is this. The question is, what is it? What is virtue? What is this quality? What is this this key ingredient for spiritual growth? Well, my dear friend, simply put, simply defined, virtue is this. Virtue is goodness. Virtue is goodness. Virtue is character that is noble and righteous and excellent. You see, the word virtue is only used four times And all the New Testament is used once by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 and verse 8. And it's used three times by Peter in his epistles. Peter used the word virtue more than any other New Testament writer. In fact, in the New American Standard Bible that I preach from, the word is not translated virtue. Instead, the word is translated excellent. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. Peter says to Christians, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith. We talked about that last month. In your faith, supply, add, grow in moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Notice how Peter says that if Christians are going to grow, if Christians are going to mature, if Christians are going to develop properly in the Lord, then they must be excellent. They must be excellent. They must have moral excellence and possess excellent character because their father who's in heaven, he has excellent character. And he has excellent morality. And he is excellent in every way possible. Go in your Bible, please, to 1 Peter chapter 1, please. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to listen to how Peter really tries to drill this home all throughout his two epistles. And in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 14, as Peter speaks to Christians, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 14, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy, notice. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, not just in some of your behavior. Be holy in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy For I am holy. God has called us to be holy like him. We are to be holy like our heavenly father is holy. Look at chapter 2. Look at chapter 2 and verse number 9. Again, speaking of Christians, of disciples. Chapter 2 and verse 9. But you, if you're a Christian, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim, watch it now, the excellencies. That word excellencies there is the same word as virtue. It's the same word. So that you may proclaim the virtue or the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were not, for you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1 now. We looked just a moment ago at verse number 5 where Peter says we We supply to our faith moral excellence. That's the word virtue. 
Well, look at verse number 3 of chapter 1. In verse number 3 of chapter 1, Peter says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory. Here it is again. And excellence. That word excellence is the same word. It's the same word for virtue. Notice what God has called us to do. Do you see? Notice how because God is excellent. Because he has excellent morality. Because he has excellent character. His children have been called to be excellent. We have been called to be excellent. We have been called to live by his excellent Standard. We have been given the responsibility of reflecting and showing his excellence to the world. That's our responsibility. We got to reflect and show the excellence of God to the world. We got to reflect and show the excellence of God to people on our jobs and the people at school. And when we're hanging out with our friends and with our next door neighbors and when we're interacting with people on social media and how we treat our spouse and in how we raise our kids and in how we conduct ourselves in every part of our lives, no matter where I am, no matter who I'm with, no matter if I'm the only Christian on my job or in my school or even in my family, I got to show people the excellence of God by the way I live my life. I got to do right. I got to have goodness. I got to show people God's standard and how God's people strive to be holy and different and set apart from the wickedness of this world. That, my dear friends, is what it means to have virtue. That's what it means to have virtue. Virtue is about goodness. It's about having character like God, character that is noble, and righteous and excellent. In fact, let's dig a little bit deeper on that. Let's talk a little bit about what virtue requires. Let's talk about this in a very practical way. What exactly does having virtue require? Well, simply put, and I like simple things, you know that. Simply defined, simply put, virtue looks like this. It looks like a person applying the Bible. It looks like a person applying the Bible into their life. It requires not just reading your Bible, not just studying your Bible, not just believing in your Bible and quoting your Bible and filling your head up with a bunch of Bible information so you can win a bunch of Bible trivia games. No, 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 no. If you're going to have virtue, you got to live the Bible. You got to do what the Bible says. You got to put the information you find in the scriptures in the practice in your daily life. You see, virtuous people do this. Virtuous people strive to live a pure life. They strive to live a pure life. They strive to live a sexually pure life. If they're single, they strive to abstain from sex. If they're married, they strive to abstain from adultery. If they're married again, they strive to not flirt and develop inappropriate relationships with people who are not their spouse. Remember what Peter said. Going back to 1 Peter, look at chapter 2, please. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 11. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter says, he's speaking to Christians here, Beloved, I urge you as aliens, pilgrims, and strangers. So notice how Peter says, this world we're living in is not our true home. Let's not get too comfortable. This is not our true home. This is not our true country. We're aliens. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. We're just passing through here. Our real home is with our Father. It's with God. And Peter says we need to understand that. He says, I urge you as aliens and strangers to do what? To abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Notice how Peter says, as we live as aliens and strangers and pilgrims in this life, we must abstain from fleshly lust. We must live pure. If we're single, we abstain from sex. If we're married, we're faithful to our spouse. We're dedicated to our spouse. We're striving to keep the vows we made to our spouse. Christians with virtue practice pure living. But not only do they have pure living, you know what else they got? They got pure speech. They have pure speech. 
They avoid speaking like the world. They avoid cursing like the world. They avoid using the Lord's name in vain like the world. They avoid speaking words of gossip and slander like the world. They have pure living and they have pure speech. And you know what else they also have? They have pure thoughts. They strive to have pure thoughts. Look at Philippians chapter 4, please. In Philippians chapter 4 and in verse number 8, Paul says this in Philippians 4 and verse 8. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is, here it is again, any excellence is the same word for virtue. It's the same word for virtue. If there is any excellence or virtue, anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Notice how in addition to living, striving to live virtuous lives, Virtuous people also have virtuous thoughts. They also do their best to think on the right kinds of things. As Brother Brian pointed out this past Wednesday in his invitation, virtuous people allow God to influence their thoughts. They allow God to influence their minds. They're constantly feeding spiritual things into their minds and they're adhering to those things and they're doing their best to block out and protect their minds from the things of Satan. That's what virtuous people do. They strive to have pure lives, pure speech, pure thoughts. But let's also add on this honorable relationships. Honorable relationships. That is the main thing that Peter is emphasizing in, first, in the book of 1 Peter. Go back to chapter 2 again of 1 Peter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you look at verse number 12. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12, after telling us to abstain from fleshly lust, which weighs war against the soul, in verse number 12 of chapter 2, he says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. There's the word again. There the word is again. The word is virtue there. It's virtue. Keep your behavior excellent. Keep your behavior virtuous as you live among people in the world. How do we do that, Peter? Well, Peter goes on to tell us in the rest of the book. If you have time today, and I, and I know you got busy schedules, but if you have some time before you go to bed, just read the rest of 1 Peter. Peter tells us how to have excellent behavior. He says that a big part of that is having honorable relationships. Behaving honorably in our relationships. Submitting to the government and those who have authority over us. Striving to be good model citizens and avoiding being troublemakers, behaving honorably in the relationships we have with our spouse, wives submitting to their husbands, whether they are Christians or whether they are not Christians, husbands dealing with their wives in an understanding way and treating their wives right so that their prayers won't be hindered, avoiding being vindictive and arrogant and unkind to brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, a big chunk. A big chunk of the book of First Peter is about stressing the importance of behaving honorably in our relationships. It's about stressing the importance of understanding that excellent behavior requires doing right by other people, treating people right, treating other people like Jesus treated other people. You studied the Gospels. You studied Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it doesn't take very long to realize that when the Lord Jesus Christ was walking on this earth 2,000 years ago, he wasn't a troublemaker. He wasn't going around looking for trouble. He wasn't some ugly and mean person. He didn't behave dishonorably in his relationships. He didn't turn the other way when he saw people needed help. He wasn't unkind. He didn't show partiality among men. He wasn't rude. He wasn't selfish. He wasn't always looking to insult and bully and, and tear people down emotionally. That's not how Jesus was in the Bible. It's that the Bible says that Jesus was a good person. He was a good person. He was an excellent person. He behaved in an excellent manner. And all the interactions he had with other people, and if we want to be excellent like Jesus, then we got to do the same. We got to have pure lives and pure speech and pure thoughts and honorable relationships. But I got to add to it this. If you're going to have virtue, if we're going to have virtue, then, then we got to have some courage. We got to have some moral courage. 
Go back in your Bible to 1 Peter. Notice how we're really kind of trying to stick in, in the letters of Peter this morning. And we go to what Peter is saying. And remember, Peter's writing to Christians in the first century who were suffering, who were being persecuted for their faith and going through other forms of suffering. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 3, in verse 3, Peter says to Christians, For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. You should have given that stuff up when you came to, to the Lord. Having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Peter says in verse 4, in all of this, you've given this stuff up. And in doing that, they, that's the people in the world, they are surprised that you now run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You know, I wish I could tell you this morning. I wish I could tell you that if you have virtue, if you have moral excellence, if you do your best to be like Jesus and live by the standard of the Bible, I wish I could tell you that the world is going to praise you for that. The world is going to like you. They're going to pat you on the back. They're going to be so impressed with you, and they're going to put you on a pedestal. You're never going to have any problems. I wish, honestly, I wish I could tell you that, but I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that based on these verses. I can't tell you that with a straight face based on what Peter is saying in those verses. Notice how according to Peter, being virtuous in a dark, sinful, and depraved world, it is not easy. It's not easy at all. It's going to require some conviction. It's going to require some courage. It's going to require some commitment. It's going to require us standing for what we know is right, even if the world responds to it in a negative way. That's what it means to have virtue. And remember, that's what Joseph did, did he not? Remember Joseph, book of Genesis, Potiphar's wife, his master's wife, trying to have an affair with him trying to lie with him, but what does Joseph do? Joseph says, no, I can't do that and sin against God. Joseph stood with God's moral standard, even though he was a long way from his family in Egypt. And doing that actually got him locked up in jail. He suffered because he had virtue, but he had the courage to do what was right, and he didn't care what the consequences were. And you remember, remember Daniel? Remember Daniel? We studied him a couple of weeks ago. Remember, even though he's in Babylon as a captive, a long way from his family, he said, I'm going to stay committed to God's, God's dietary restrictions according to the law. I am not going to eat the food that King Nebuchadnezzar puts in front of me. That's called virtue. Daniel had the courage to stick with God's law, no matter what the consequences were. And remember his three friends. Remember Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They said, hey. We'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. You can throw us in the furnace, but we're not going to bow down and worship an idol. That's called virtue. And you remember Queen Esther? Remember Esther? Remember she risked her life to protect God's people and prevent them from being exterminated from the wicked man named Haman? Haman? Esther had virtue. And you remember the apostles in Acts chapter 5? Remember even though they had been beaten? and thrown in jail, and told to stop preaching the name of Jesus. The apostle Peter spoke for all of them in Acts 5, verse 29, and he said, we must obey God rather than, we obey God rather than men. That's virtue. You see, all these people, Daniel, his three friends, Esther, Joseph, the apostles, all these people had virtue. All of them had moral virtue. Courage. They stood for the things of God, even though there were some bad things that happened to them as a result. And that's how we got to be. We have to be just like them. We got to be people of moral courage, even when the world is hostile to us. Even when the world mocks us, even when the world makes fun of us, even when it might cost us a high paying job or a promotion on our job, or a relationship with a boyfriend, or with a girlfriend, or a relationship even with a family member, no matter what it might cost us, we got to have the courage to always stand for what's right. We got to have the courage to always stand with the Lord, 
and with his standard. We got to always be willing to tell people that we are Christians. We are disciples. We're followers of Jesus. And we don't do anything that goes against God's will. That's what it means to have virtue. Virtue requires pure living, honorable relationships, and having the courage to stand on godly principles. And I'm going to tell you something. When we have that stuff there, it's going to impact people. It's going to impact a lot of people. It's going to impact, first and foremost, God. It's going to impact our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is going to be pleased with us as he watches us from his throne in heaven. Having a virtue is going to impact the Heavenly Father and it's also going to impact the world. It's going to impact the world. Go back to that passage, please, in 1 Peter 2. Look at verse 12 again. We only read half that verse. I want to read the whole verse this time. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12, Peter says to Christians, keep your behavior excellent, virtuous, among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they, the world, may because of your good deeds as they observe them. As they notice them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Notice how while some people in the world are going to persecute us. Some people in the world are going to mock us. They're going to make fun of us. They're going to shun us. They're going to make it their mission to come after us and do whatever they can to make us compromise their, our faith. Even though the world is going to respond to us at times like that, Peter says that there's some other people in the world who are going to observe our virtue. They're going to observe our excellent behavior and they're going to become curious. They're going to be convicted. They're going to respect us, actually, and want to know more about how they can share with us in the faith that we are a part of. They're going to want to know, why are you so different? Why are you so different? Why are your values so different? Why do you always stay out of trouble? Why are you so full of happiness and joy, and peace and optimism? Why is your marriage so great? Why are your kids so well behaved? Why do, you, why do you have such solid friendships? Why do you have such a good work ethic? Why are you so committed to your Christian faith? You see, having virtue, according to Peter, can cause the world to become curious. It can cause the world to want to glorify God. It can cause them to begin thinking about God and seeking God and desiring to share with us in the kingdom of God. Virtue can impact the world. But let me also put up here, it can impact, it can impact our family. It can impact our family. Isn't that exactly what the Bible tells us about a woman in Proverbs 31 who's called the virtuous woman? Remember what the Bible said about that virtuous woman? Remember the Bible tells us in Proverbs 31 that because of her character, because of her virtue, because of her excellent behavior, because she was a woman who pleased God and honored God, not only did she bring glory to God, but she also brought glory to her family. She brought honor and glory to her husband and to her kids. And remember what Peter said about excellent women who are married to men who are not Christians in 1 Peter 3? Remember, Peter said that a woman who lives by God's standard, a woman who is virtuous, but she may have an unbelieving husband, she can actually have the opportunity to win her husband. Peter says she might win her husband not by constantly nagging him, not by constantly bugging him and trying to force feed him the gospel. But Peter says that that kind of woman could win an unbelieving husband by her behavior. By her conduct, by her chaste and respectful behavior. And for you young folks, for the young people here, if you don't think how you conduct yourself and how you behave doesn't have an impact on your parents, then you need to go home and read some Proverbs. You need to read Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 1, where the Bible says, A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish child brings shame to his mother. How we conduct ourselves, the standard we live by, it has an impact on so many people. And so let's close with this right here. There's one more thing I want to talk about very quickly. 
I want to close with this. How do we get it? Okay, we know what it is. We know its importance. We know who it impacts. But now I want to know how to get it. I need me some virtue. Well, let me give you four things we got to do if we're going to get some virtue very quickly. First, if we're going to get virtue, if we're going to acquire virtue, the first thing we got to do is we got to seek it by the right standard. You got to seek it by the right standard. I'm going in my Bible to the 119th Psalm, if you want to join me there. Psalm 119. If you remember in Psalm 119 in verse number 105, the psalmist describes the word of God as a lamp to his feet and a light to his path. Remember that passage? Let's put another section of scripture with that in Psalm 119 in verse 9. In Psalm 119 in verse 9, the Bible says, how can a young man, watch this young people, how can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word? Your word. With all your heart, with all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart so that I can live right, so that I may not sin against you. You put that with what Paul said in a familiar section of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, where Paul says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or woman of God may be mature, perfect, equipped for every good work. There it is. There it is. Notice how the right standard to acquire virtue is not the standard of the world. It's not the standard of our society. It's not the standard of our culture. It is not the talk shows and the best-selling self-help books and the information that's being fed to us by the media and the rich and the famous people in Hollywood. No, no, no. The right standard to acquire virtue is the Bible. It's the word of God. It's that book you have right in front of you this morning. You see, that book you have, whether in paper form or digital form before you this morning, that is a book that comes from God. That comes from God. That comes from the mind of God. That comes from the mind of somebody who is perfectly excellent and he's holy and he's good and he gives us a standard that will help us become just like him. If we're going to get virtue, we got to seek, seek it through the right standard, which is the Bible. But it's not enough just to seek, seek it through the right standard. We also got to do it. Got to practice it. Got to implement it in my life. James puts it this way. If you remember in James 1 and verse 22, James says that we ought to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude ourselves or deceive ourselves. If you remember in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, in verse number 20 of Matthew 7, Jesus says that you can know a tree by its fruits. You can know false teachers, religious teachers by their fruit, by their behavior, by the things they teach. And you really can know all people by their fruit. You can know all people by the things they, they do, by their behavior. Why? Well, because behavior or actions tell others the truth about us. What we do tells others the truth. It tells people the truth about our character. It tells people the truth about our convictions. It tells people the truth about whether we are really sold on the gospel message or if our Christianity is fake and phony and fraudulent. If we're going to get virtue, we've got to seek it through the right standard. And we've got to do it. We've got to practice it. In fact, let's add to the list, we've got to live unselfishly. We got to live unselfish lives. We got to live lives if we're going to have virtue of self denial, a life that says no to the things I may want to do and the things I may want to pursue with my life, and I got to say yes to God. I got to say yes to Jesus. I got to say yes to the things He wants me to do. Jesus put it this way if you remember in Luke, the ninth chapter. You remember how in Luke, the ninth chapter, Jesus told us this in verse number 23. In Luke, the ninth chapter, in verse number 23, Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must, he must deny himself. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
You see, if I'm going to follow Jesus, in addition to taking up my cross, that's the idea of suffering for the Lord. In addition to being willing to suffer for the Lord, I got to deny myself. I got to put my will aside. I got to put his will first. His will must be the chief thing I am focused on in my life. I like how Paul put it in Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 2, please. In Galatians chapter 2 and in verse number 20. This, this is a powerful passage here. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Do you see what that passage is dripping with? You see what it's dripping with? You see how that passage is dripping with language of self-denial. It's dripping with language from the pen of a man who put the Lord first and foremost in his life. He put the Lord's will above his own will. I submit that if we have that same kind of mindset, we're going to make some good decisions. We're going to make some excellent decisions. We're going to make some virtuous decisions. We're going to forgive people when a big part of us wants to harbor a grudge. We're going to be kind and gracious to people when a big part of us wants to get revenge. We're going to be pure and we're going to practice some self-control when we're tempted to give in to one night of passion. See, virtue. If we're going to acquire virtue, then we got to put the Lord first. We got to live unselfishly. His will must be the chief concern of our lives. And then let me close with this. If you want to get virtue, just imitate some virtuous people. Imitate virtuous people. We need to imitate the virtuous people who are in this room right now. We need to watch them. Watch how they do things. Watch how they make decisions. Watch how they talk. Watch how they walk. We need to imitate the virtuous behavior of our shepherds, men who are an example to the flock. We need to imitate the virtuous behavior of our parents or our godly grandparents. We need to imitate the virtuous behavior of faithful servants of God that we can read about in the Bible. People like Paul and David and Peter and Daniel and Joseph and Mary. And we especially need to imitate the virtuous and excellent behavior of Jesus the Christ. We especially need to, especially need to make sure that we're striving every single day to be just like Jesus. We're striving to talk like Jesus and walk like Jesus and view and stand against sin like Jesus and fight against temptation like Jesus and live disciplined lives like Jesus and treat people like Jesus and love people like Jesus and seek the Father's will above anything else like Jesus. Remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, be imitators of me as I also Imitate Christ. We can't go wrong. We can't go wrong if we imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. And so going back to the areas where you feel you need to grow, going back to that list I started with, after studying some things about virtue, would you now put that on your list? Would you do that now? Would you now at least consider the fact that you need to grow and I need to grow and some virtue? Peter says we, we, we need to think about that. We, we, we should want to grow in our virtue. We should want to add a strong level of virtue to our faith because in the end, let me tell you something, having virtue is going to pay off. It's going to pay off when we die. It's going to pay off when the Lord comes back like a thief in the night while the world might mock us and make fun of us and ridicule us because we're striving to live by God's standard. The Lord notices the Lord sees, the Lord knows who all of the virtuous people are, and he is pleased with those people, and he will reward them in eternity. And so may God bless you as we strive to grow in our virtue together. Maybe there's someone here this morning, and you say, hey, I need some of that. I need to grow. I need some help growing. I need some help growing in my virtue. If we can help you with that, we'll love to, to be able to do that, whether it's pray with you, pray for you, have a Bible study with you, whatever you need as far as spiritual growth goes. We'll be more than happy to accommodate you. Or if there's someone here and you say, I haven't even begun 
the journey of spiritual growth. Haven't even obeyed the gospel. You have an opportunity in about two minutes to do that as well. If you will confess faith in Christ and repent of your sins and obey his commandment to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you will become part of the family of God. And so if we can help you with that at all, come to the front. Let's stand. Let's sing. When we walk.